Deep. Good evening, or perhaps good afternoon and welcome. Bienvenidos, friends of the Hispanic Society. This is our third installment of our member exclusive program, the Tertulias de Arte Hispano, or Hispanic Art Gatherings. The first Tuesday of every month is the one you should mark off in order to come and visit us at this time. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with the Hispanic Society's Head of Conservation, Hélène Fontoira Marzin, another is French, conservator of paintings and sculpture uh, for 17 years at the Hispanic Society. Mrs. Fontoira seems to have accumulated a great many degrees in <laughs> conservation, uh, a bachelor's uh, from the Escuela Superior de Conservación y Restauración in Galicia, a postgraduate degree at the Institut Royal du Patrimoine Artistique in Brussels, uh, the, in Italy, the Instituto per l'Arte e il Restauro, which is in Florence. She also has a, uh, a master's in uh, protection of cultural heritage from the University of Vigo in Spain. Mrs. Fontara has uh, not only conserved works of art at the Hispanic Society, but also in a number of other institutions in Kerguene, which is in Brittany in France, at the Prado, at the Metropolitan Museum. Her expertise, and it explains a little bit the, uh, the, the title and what we are going to speak in tonight, is very much in the conservation of polychrome statuary. And she will speak this evening of a number of works, uh, which is part of the strength of the Hispanic society, uh, notably by uh, Luisa, uh, Roldan or La Roldana. Uh, as you know, the format is that after Elaine's presentation, after the Q&A, I will be asking some questions and some comments and questions at the end. You are by all means to submit, if you please, your questions and comments. You can do so, by the way, at any point during the conversation and the discussion uh, using the comments uh, section. And uh, now it is my privilege and pleasure uh, to ask Ellen Fontora to share the screen and begin uh, with the slides. And here we go with La Roldana and our Tertulia. Uh, thank you, Philippe. Uh, good evening to everybody. And thank you for joining us. And thank you, Philippe, for uh, the beautiful uh, presentation. I'm gonna share the screen now, let's see. Sure. Uh, I think I'm ready now, right? Wonderful. Yes. Why, why, why is this not moving now? Just wait a second. I don't know what's going on. Just have it. Oh, okay. Okay, so, I mean, this is gonna be this now. The Hispanic Society owns five no. 17th century. Can you see the screen? No, you no? press the green button at the bottom, share screen. Okay. Now, now I'm confused here, okay. Um, She's better at polychromy than... Uh, <laughs> than, than, than okay, escape. Just excuse, excuse me for that, excuse me for that. Share, uh, okay, let me do this. I believe the button is green. Okay, share screen. Share screen again. Good. So finally, right? Yes. Now Good. I go to the first one. I go to slideshow. Oof. So let's see if it works now. Perfect. Now I think finally it works. Okay. So the Hispanic Society owns five 17th century polychrome terracotta works of art made by the Spanish female sculptor Luisa Ignacia Roldan, also known as La Roldan. Despite her importance, there are only 11 pieces by her in North American museums, five of which are in our collection. 
We have three small scale groups. The ones, uh, the three, the three that you see at the top, and a near and two near life size decapitated heads. Born in 1656 in Seville, Luisa Maria Francisca Ignacia Roldán Villavicencio grew up in a family of sculptors. She learned her art from her father, the famous master Pedro Roldán. After she moved to Madrid in 1688, she began creating a small polychrom terracotta groups of religious subjects or religious subjects. Her patrons acquired these to decorate their homes or chapels as well as convents and churches in Madrid. When she received the title of court sculptor, Escultora de Cámara, in 1692, she was the first woman to hold this position. She died in 1606, only a few days after being named a member of the Academia Nazionale di San Luca in Rome. Uh, I'm going to interrupt you here to ask yes. a question because, first of all, it's a quite remarkable that a, a woman achieved such fame in the 17th century, as we know. But the Hispanic Society also, if I'm not mistaken, owns uh, two works by uh, another woman artist, uh, uh, Andrea uh, de Mena, Pablo de Mena's daughter. Uh, she was not a member of the same society? Uh, if, if she was of the society? Well, a uh, member of the guild, or oh, okay. It is it is a to it is a it is a totally different subject because uh, actually, um, uh, Luisa Roldan she was independent. She got married and and she did her own works. But um, Andrea de Mena went to a monastery, so the work she did was at the monastery, and uh, she was she never had the freedom in a way that uh, Luisa Roldan had but uh, her works of art are uh, incredible as well. Okay. Okay. Even though Luisa Roldan is well known for her small polychrome terracotta groups, she, she was also a prolific artist in, wo in wooden polychrome sculptures. She left us multiple examples of her work in Spain. We even have an example at the Getty Museum of a one San Ginés de la Jara. If you, if you, if you get the chance, Go on, on Google and Google San, San Ginés de la Jara at the Getty. It's a, it's a beautiful, incredible sculpture and with the, the perfect example of a destofado. Okay, let's see if it works this. Oh, it works, good. Here we have, we have an image of the repose in the flight into Egypt. The Virgin is seated holding on her lap the Christ child. At the left kneels an angel holding palm grenades. At the right, St. Joseph offers a pomegranate to the child. Behind the Virgin rises a pomegranate tree with cherubs perched in its branches. I wanted to show you some details of Luisa's fine work, li like the bird on the pomegranate tree that is trying to eat a pomegranate, the bunny and the dog at the bottom of the group, and the delicate detail of the Virgin's braid and the quality of the polychromy. If you see the flesh tones, I mean, they look like uh, they are alive, right? They're, they're beautiful. This is the ecstasy of St. Mary Magdalene after conservation. The saint reclines on a couch of rocks and she is attended by angels. The Magdalene falls back with her eyes wide open while the angels catch her. The artist also describes the charm of the natural world with animals nestled in the rocks. And now I want to show you these little animals. We have, uh, as you can see, uh, we have an owl, we have uh, two bunnies and these two uh, reptiles. And Luisa al always uh, liked to add uh, li little animals to her compositions. Uh, Elaine, another Yes. yes. Uh, we're looking at wonderful details. How big is the sculpture? Give us an idea of the scale. Yes, um, actually, this is this is gonna come in in a in a different slide. I'm gonna show you, but uh, that's that's actually the art. She, she was incredible because these these uh, oh, uh, I mean these animals are like these very very little very tiny. So it's very difficult to model uh, this kind of uh, is, is small uh, sculptures. I also wanted to share with you uh, the faces of the angels because I think, for me, I think they're beautiful. I mean, my favorite one is uh, this one uh, at the top uh, left. I mean, this this chubby angel. Uh, I mean, it's, it's super cute. 
And I also want you to see the beautiful expressions of uh, these angels and all the detail, little details, even you can even see the teeth uh, uh, painted on, on the angels. Uh, this other image that I want to show you is, um, is the signature. Actually, uh, two of our groups are signed, which is uh, very important. I did try to zoom uh, these pictures as, as much as I could so you could see uh, the signature. Uh, here it says DA Luisa Roldan. And I did mark uh, with the, the circle where this, the signature is located. Did she sign most of her works? Uh, no, not really. Some of them, I mean, uh, there are, I mean, there are only two examples, uh, two examples that they were signed by her and her uh, brother-in-law, which is the, the Virgin with the Child in Chicago, uh, is the, at the Loyola Museum, and the other one is the San Michael at the Escorial. And then, uh, signature, I mean, her sing, uh, signing along, we know our two pieces, of course, and uh, uh, the one education of the Virgin that is in a private collection in Spain, and uh, the one in Detroit. There's a, there's a, there's one also in Detroit. So I wanted to show you this picture actually, so you can see the size uh, of the piece. Uh, this uh, picture was taken at the Metropolitan Museum uh, with my uh, dear colleagues. They were taking samples uh, to analyze uh, the the pigments. That uh, I will be talking about that uh, later. So you can see how really small these pieces are. So this is the mystical marriage of St. Catherine when the infant Jesus appeared to the saint in a vision and married her placing a ring on her finger. This is again the signature. Uh, you can, uh, uh, the signature says, says Doña Luisa Roldán ES. The ES means escultora which, uh, which means it's called sculpture, but unfortunately, uh, part of the wheel was uh, broken and uh, we only had the remain of ES. But uh, we have the most important part, which is uh, her signature and her name, right? Well, let me ask you something about yes. the, 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 that. Uh, this, of course, is the wheel of the uh, martyrdom. It's, martyrdom, it's yes. uh, for the saint and, but, uh, this is an age when uh, the, the gills have dissolved, uh, the sculptor could both sculpt and uh, paint, because earlier they were separate gills, uh, and the, the, you gave it to a, a painter. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I, at this time, at the time of uh, Luisa Roldan, I mean, the guild regulations were very strict. So we had the guild for painters, the guild, the guild for the sculptors, and the guild for uh, poly, uh, for uh, guilders. So it, I mean, it does make sense that uh, Luisa didn't polychrome any of her uh, works of art. Uh, they were mostly done uh, by her brother brother-in-law, and it will make sense as well because they were part of the family. But uh, I, I believe to paint, to paint and sculpture, you, you had to, to go through an exam and you, you needed to have a, your um, permit to do it, right? So this is, a, this is another example that I wanted to show you to see again the scale of the pieces. Um, this uh, on the on the left, you can see uh, this picture was taken at uh, in Mexico City at the Palacio de, Bella, de Bellas Artes. I think this lady was amazed uh, about the beauty of the piece, and she was taking a picture. And on the other side, uh, we have um, this picture that the Albuquerque Museum at the moment of the installation of uh, of the piece when uh, we, uh, the piece was uh, coming back home. And finally, the two heads, the head of St. Paul and the head of uh, St. John. I, I took this picture a few days ago, actually, when I went to the museum, because I, I thought to myself, I want them to understand the size of every, every, every single uh, piece that I'm going to talk about. So here it is. You can have uh, more or less an idea of uh, the scale of the works of, of art that we are talking about today. So. When the Hispanic Society closed for renovation in 2017, the mystical marriage of St. Catherine form, formed part of Tesoros, the traveling exhibition. That began at the, Prado, at the Prado Museum, and it is currently at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, where the viewer can see it flanked by two paintings by Luis de Morales. 
I think they did an excellent job. I, I, the piece looks beautiful in, in between the two morales. At the same time, the Hispanic Society loaned the two other groups to the Metropolitan Museum. Finally, the two heads recently appeared in Unrival, a selection of our masterpieces we exhibited at the Winter Show in 2020. Here we have a, we, we can see the heads uh, at the winter show, winter show. As you can see, the five works by Luisa Roldan occupy an important place in our collection. More than 10 years ago, we began a campaign of comprehensive conservation of them, which is largely finished today. In the process, we have learned much more about the pieces. And this is what I would like to share with you today. To begin, we need to understand the technique of these works of art model, modeling the clay to firing and finally the application of the polychromy. Luisa began working from the base upwards, adding lumps of, lumps of clay until she had the desired volume. All the while she had to pay attention to the thickness, which must be considerable in order to avo avoid cracking. Although she used her hands to model the clay, she might also have tools like punches, spatulas, and modeling tools. Although Luisa modeled the groups with great delicacy, she left the rare and the rare in a rougher state. She also hollowed out the base of the three groups, or in the case of the two heads, the back. Uh, why would you tell our viewers why she would have hollowed out the base? <laughs> yes. So, so uh, she hollowed the base uh, to avoid uh, cracks or breaks uh, during the firing process, actually. And I, and I also would like to say that it was very difficult to take this picture of the bottom because we had to put it uh, in, a, in a glass and then go underneath and take the picture because we didn't, we didn't want to move the piece, the piece too much uh, because it's very fragile. So we're very proud of uh, this picture, actually. And here we have the other one. This is the back uh, and the base of the ecstasy of Mary Magdalene. And this is the, the back of uh, the head of St. John and the head of St. Paul. Once she had finished the modeling, she fired the pieces. For this terracotta takes place at a low temperature between 700 and 750 centigrade in contrast to that required for porcelain, which is 1,400 centigrades. So I took these pictures. I, I can imagine maybe this is the way at that time uh, they, they will look. Once the piece was fired, it was ready to be painted. The high key palette seen in these sculptures is one characteristic of the Spanish Baroque. Lead white, ultramarine blue, ochres, earth tones, green, Carmine and Vermilion. The task of painting the works fell to Luisa Roldan's brother-in-law, Tomás de los Arcos, who demonstrated great the delicacy of touch, which we can, we can admire in the highlights in the hair gilded with a tip of a brush. Although the pieces were in perfect condition when they left Luisa's studio, studio Several things happen over the ensuing centuries that require a conservator's intervention. The most obvious relates to the polychromy. These colors were more than a final touch. They gave the work its distinctive appearance. Yet, they often attracted attention from later owners who wanted a different look. Therefore, they had the works repainted, thereby altering the piece significantly. These repaints can discolor and disfigure the sculptures thereby necessitating treatment. Before starting a conservation process, the conservator must understand the materials, techniques, and art artist artistic process of these objects, as well as the deterioration over the years. Using the advanced scientific tools available today, the project involves interdisciplinary collaboration to examine and analyze samples from the painted surface and clay itself. We began by looking at the pieces with a stereo microscope to understand the different layers of polychromy. This is important because these statues were fre frequently overpainted. One rarely finds a sculpture with its original uh, colors intact. 
I don't have a drink, but I'm gonna drink some water. Okay. No, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Other tests reveal aspect of the surface. For instance, we use UV light to see how fluoresces. When in this example, the right wing has a totally different tonality, it reveals that it is a later addition. When necessary, we also perform x-rays to understand the nature of the support and all restorations. Here, on the base of the mystical marriage of St. Catherine, we can see two pieces of metal at the bottom used in an old restoration to reinforce the base. I just marked it with the two arrows, you see? Otherwise, I mean, if, if, we, didn't, if we didn't do the x-ray, we wouldn't know that this piece had a, these, these two pieces of metal there. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's an important piece of information. Thanks to a collaboration project with the Metropolitan Museum called NIX, Network Initiative for Conservation Science, small museums like ours has now access to state-of-the-art research facilities and analytical instrumentation. With this program, we analyze the polychromy and the terracotta clay. Here we have an example of the polychromy samples taken from the repose on the flight into Egypt. This kind of samples helps us to understand the nature of the paint, the different pigments and the binders used. This is also a way to determine how much overpaint a piece has and if the polychromy is original. Actually, for, uh, I would like to add that uh, thanks to for, uh, thanks of uh, this kind of analysis, we were we were able to understand the pieces much more because at the beginning we thought that uh, these polychrome terracottas were done like uh, wooden polychrome sculptures, which is you have the wood, uh, uh, you have the preparation layer, and then the paint on top. But thanks to the analysis, we we discovered that these uh, uh, terracottas are painted just directly to the, uh, to the terracotta uh, surface. So this is an example of the results of analysis of the terracotta of the head of St. John. This analysis revealed that both heads have the same clay and were fired at the same temperature, meaning they are a pair. And you can, always, uh, you can also see that uh, the, temper the firing temperature is, is, is higher than the groups, the, the firing temperature is 950, uh, in between 900 and 1000 uh, grade uh, centigrade. So now this is the mystical marriage of St. Catherine before conservation. As you can see, uh, it, it, the piece has a very a, a yellowish, a brownish uh, appearance. Me, I call it like a symphony of browns. And um, we needed to do something about it because uh, we needed uh, the piece to come back to life. So I'm going to show you a few examples of uh, the before and after. Uh, as you can see here, uh, after cleaning uh, this, uh, this little putty, uh, we can actually enjoy the rosy cheeks, the blue, the beautiful blue eyes. And, um, and this is the final result. Uh, here in this example, I, I mark with a red arrow. I also wanted to show you uh, one, uh, one paint loss and uh, clay loss as well. And you can see the before and after the, the treatment. I have to say that these little putties are adorable. <laughs> okay, so uh, this, is, uh, this is the ring, uh, the ring, the detail of the ring uh, before conservation. This picture, I mean, what I would like to say is that uh, in terms of course of conservation, uh, the most important uh, or difficult process is the process of cleaning. It can be a painting, it could be a sculpture because it is irreversible. A anything that you take away, you take, you cannot put back. So this is the perfect example of a, a overclean. That means that this, um, uh, this ring doesn't have any original color left. And it is, it is really a shame because in an old restoration, they did an overcleaning. But let's go to the next uh, one. Here it is. Thanks to the stereo microscope, uh, we, did, uh, we did a study and we were able to find uh, some remains of uh, the original colors. Uh, at the same time, I have to say that I have the help of uh, our curator emeritus, uh, Dr. Priscilla Muller, 
that uh, one of her, her specialities is is um, is a uh, Spanish jewelry. So she she gave me all the examples of uh, uh, what um, a wedding ring will look uh, at the Baroque times, and actually everything matched. And I was uh, very happy and, and pleased with the result. So uh, this is the before and after. So again, the, the, we have uh, the Symphony of Browns. Uh, we didn't know what we were gonna find uh, underneath once uh, we cleaned the piece. Uh, this is actually uh, St. Catherine's. Um, some, uh, I mean, most of, of the paint was uh, underneath, uh, but uh, again, with the stereo microscope, we, we were able to, to see the color of the pearls and, and the red, and we were able to recreate and, and bring to life uh, such a beautiful piece. And since I like this figure so much, I showed you the back and, I'm, and now I, I want to show you the profile because uh, I think uh, it came out uh, beautifully. And uh, even now, now before you can see that they, they over clean and, and you couldn't even see uh, the pearl earring. And, and after the conservation, there you have the pearl earring. And this is uh, the before and after as well. And as you can see, the signature, you can even read the signature now. Before it was uh, difficult to see the signature. And this is the before and after, before uh, oxidized varnish brown, after uh, uh, the piece for me came to life. So this is um, this is the repose in the flight into Egypt uh, before conservation. Um, this piece was uh, as well very co uh, it was very complicated, and I'm gonna show you why. Uh, here, the problem with this piece, as I discussed before, uh, is the the overpaint. Uh, so uh, in the annotated drawing, the orange color is all is all the areas that they had uh, overpaint. And, and after a study, uh, we were able to determine that the original colors were underneath. So we decided to remove all the overpaint. But the problem is, I'm, I'm gonna show you here. The problem is, since I explained to you before, uh, the paint was applied directly to the terracotta and the, the paint layer was very thin and we couldn't use any kind of solvent. It had to be removed uh, dry with a scalpel and, and a stereo microscope. So I believe half of my eyesight went into this piece, but uh, the result uh, uh, was worth it. So here you can see at the top, uh, the Prussian blue over paint and uh, at the bottom, the original ultramarine blue. So this was, it, it took a long time, but uh, this is the final result. So before you have a, you have a flat, a dark uh, uh, Prussian blue, and then you have a beautiful uh, ultramarine blue and, and, and the same with the, with the Virgin's robe. The same thing happened with the saddlebags that they are, they are located at, uh, at, the base, uh, at the base of the group. Uh, you can see before, I mean, the overpaint was uh, this beige uh, thick paint and it was uh, removed uh, uh, again with the scalpel and the stereo, stereo microscope. And this is the final result. And uh, just look at the gore, how beautiful the colors are once, uh, once we remove uh, the overpaint. And this is St. Joseph, Joseph's Cape. Uh, the same thing happened. We had to remove uh, all the overpaint. And this is the final result. And I think uh, the, the piece is really vibrant with all these uh, original colors. The, uh, this is the ecstasy of St. Mary Magdalene before conservation. Uh, actually, uh, this piece was in fairly good condition. Uh, we only needed to do some uh, light, uh, light cleaning and we found a few chips uh, of the terracotta here and there, but uh, uh, it was pretty straightforward. This is a test cleaning, so you can see uh, the way uh, all the flesh tones uh, were, was gonna look after the cleaning. And this is the before and after. Even though it was a, a very light cleaning, you can see the difference. And this is another surprise that, uh, it's, uh, as conservators, we always find surprises. So um, for this uh, for this head, uh, the same thing happened. Uh, we saw uh, we saw that uh, all the blue uh, was an overpaint. It was a Prussian dark uh, blue, 
and we did a study the piece and we knew that the original uh, ultramarine blue was underneath so we decided to remove all the overpaint but once we we remove all the under uh, all the overpaint we found an old restoration so uh, we don't know why uh, to uh, to fill to fill the gaps of or the losses they use wax and then um, and they use um, the, a preparation uh, for for the break, right? So what we what we did, uh, I have to say that uh, in conservation we try to always be do minimal intervention. So anything that is not necessary, we don't want to do it. We, we we want to be very respectful uh, respectful of the of the works of art. So in this case, it wasn't necessary to do anything else. The only thing we did is remove the wax and add. Uh, uh, proper uh, proper uh, material gesso, and then uh, we did uh, in painting. And even when we do in painting and we use the colors, all the colors uh, we use uh, they are reversible. So this is the final result uh, after uh, after the in painting, and. Um, uh, let, let, yes. let me ask you a question. Let, let me ask you a question about. Yes, yes, the yes. We showed them at the uh, exhibition uh, in an almost vertical position. Do we know um, how they would have been presented at the time? Horizontal, sitting on the table, hanging on a wall? Uh, do we have any idea? Any clues? So um, we, we, we think that uh, maybe the stands that uh, you can see in the picture, we think that they might be, they might be original. And um, maybe, probably, uh, these pieces were exhibited in an angle, but we're not sure. Uh, maybe in private uh, collections, uh, people would like to present them on top of a table. But uh, I have a few pictures that I, I save, and I'm going to show them to you uh, at the end of the... And maybe that, uh, that will answer the question. All right. But I knew somebody was going to ask me the, this question, so I prepared I prepare a couple of uh, uh, photographs for that. So uh, this is um, uh, this is uh, the head of St. Paul. Uh, we had the same issue, uh, the overpaint um, Prussian blue. We just removed the over, uh, overpaint Prussian blue. We didn't find any surprise. Everything was fine. So we just uh, did a cleaning, uh, a, a few in painting here and there, and that's it. And this is the end. But I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the other pictures that I have here because they are here. So, this uh, Patrick Patrick Lenagan uh, gave me gave me these pictures because uh, he likes to travel. When he has time, he travels all over Spain, and he took these pictures, and he showed them to me. And I thought that they were they, it would be interesting to share with you. And as you can see here is in a church in Cadiz, and you see the way the the, the way the head is presented. So it's quite vertical, right? So I don't know. I think it's depending on people's taste, right? Right. Well, uh, I may have a question or two further, but uh, I like to give a little bit of space and time for our friends and those of you who are watching. So keep the keep the no no keep. The, oh, sorry. Because we may want to refer back to one of the pictures. Oh, so, okay. Um, uh, Christina Aldrich, do you want to uh, communicate any? Question yes. from our audience. Thank you so much, Elin. That was wonderful. We do have a couple questions that I have come you. in um, from a member in New York City, and they are wondering how many terracottas um, Luisa Roldan completed, or if you happen to know how many, and how many pieces are in the U.S. Okay, so this question the, uh, is, in a way, is a it's a difficult question because there is no catalog resume of uh, Luisa Roldan, so there's still work to to do. Uh, the la I mean, the the last person that did a publication was uh, Kathy Halson. Uh, actually, she's from Australia and she did her uh, PhD on uh, Luisa Roldan, and she wrote a monograph uh, in 2000, uh, in 2018. And she says that uh, more or less between uh, 30 and 40, but uh, sometimes new pieces come in the, in the market. So it's hard to say. And I believe uh, there's still a private, in private collection, the, uh, collections, there are still um, many, many groups that we're gonna see eventually. And I don't, I don't remember the other question. 
What was the other question? Yes, how many terracottas there are total and then how many in the US? So I think you, you did address both questions. Uh, uh, we, we, there's, a, there's one at the Museum of Detroit, is uh, Virgen de la Soledad. Uh, there's a San John the Baptist uh, at the Meadows Museum. And there's a, a Virgin with a Child and San John the Baptist at the Loyola Museum in Chicago. Uh, there's another one at the Blanton Museum, uh, is the Education of the Virgin. Uh, the one at the Metropolitan Museum and the uh, Hours. And there's another one at the Getty Museum, the one that I, I mentioned before, but uh, that one, uh, the San Ginés de la Jara, is a, a wooden polychrome sculpture. It's not a terracotta. So the answer is 10 uh, terra polychrome terracotta and one wooden sculpture. Great, thank you. And we have another question um, from member Deborah Feller. And she's wondering, is it true that as a court painter, Luisa Roldan never got paid. Do you know anything about the payment? Yes, I mean, there, there is a lot of controversy about uh, Luisa Roldan. And actually, uh, I was, I was, uh, I was re reading the monograph the other day, the Van, Van uh, the Kathy Halsen. And, and she, she was, what she was saying is that, uh, I mean, she has proved that she was paid, but uh, the amount, the amount of money that she was paid wasn't enough for her to survive. So actually, uh, she, she, she had a tough time. Yes, she was pretty much poor. But she got paid, but not enough. Great, thank you. And another question, uh, I'm going to combine two of them because they're similar. It has to do with the image of the ring that you showed. Yes. Um, we have a member wondering if the colors of that ring uh, were revealed underneath the paint or if you painted those and what was that process like? Like how much in painting and repainting has to be done to bring back all of the stunning colors? So uh, actually uh, what, what I can say is that I didn't invent the colors at all. So. I just found the remains. So in the middle of the ring, it was the remain, the, the red remain, which is uh, supposedly to be a ruby. And then I found remains of uh, all over of uh, gold. So I did, I did paint, I did paint it, but uh, I could, I have uh, the original to be able to do the in painting. Wonderful, thank you. And another question from Key Eljoy Jr. Um, as La Roldana uh, worked in clay, did she also furnish models for any of the Spanish porcelain factories or any other ceramic factory? Not that I know. I don't think so. No. Okay. And then a final question from uh, our member Robert Simon. Were the two heads of Paul and John always attributed to La Roldana? Um, well, they were they were recently attributed. Uh, well, no, recently a few years ago, uh, by the scholar uh, Plegatuelo uh, in Spain. But uh, because actually, I think we never put the time on 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 studying the pieces. But uh, once we started to restore and look at them. Uh, we decided that uh, they really look, uh, they are Luisa Roland's uh, heads. But they do, they do, they do. Wonderful, thank you. It's, and it's, a, it's an attribution that conceivably could be contested and could change. Yes. That can all be, be changed, right? Yep. Unless, it's, unless it's signed, <laughs> we can always change it. I have, I have another question along the same lines as that on the ring. You mentioned that uh, over the centuries, many of these pieces going from collection to collection were overpainted and that different collectors kept overpainting them. Uh, can you be sure in every instance that you are recovering the original first layer put on by La Roldana or a member of the family? Or uh, do you sometimes, because of condition, choose in a defining moment at a different period? Uh, that's uh, that's why that's why, for example, when 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 we're not sure about it, that's why we want to take samples. 
because we want to see what uh, which what's uh, the 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 first the first layer and in this case it was very obvious uh, we didn't do we didn't need to do any sampling but uh, when we we have any any kind of doubt we just do the sam the sampling and then we can see absolutely all the, all the layers and and all the different overpaints so in this case that was the original color yes oh that's great uh, are there any uh, other questions uh, christina those are all the actually uh there's just one comment from one of our members that there is one more Roldana at the Speed Art Museum in Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, ah, well, mm, the well, list. Let's see. I don't know if it's a Roldana or not. Ah, here we go. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen the piece. <laughs> Issues of connoisseurship and uh, attribution. Since we're talking about uh, uh, pieces of sculpture in different uh, uh, museums, I would like to end by by uh, saying that uh, in having five of the more or less 10 or 11 in the United States is only one indication of the richness and the depth of the collections of the Hispanic Society Museum and Library, because uh, we know about the great collections of uh, painting and the seven El Grecos, three great Velasquez, and on and on, with the greatest Goya in America as well, uh, and the Sorollas. But we have also an extraordinary collection of sculpture from the Middle Ages all the way through the Renaissance, where we have the two greatest tomb uh, ensembles, better than any other museum in the United States, those from Cuellar, uh, the Duchess of Albuquerque, uh, wonderful sculpture by Gil de Siloe, uh, Pedro de Mena, one of his finest uh, sculptures of saint with a dramatically head cut off, uh, the two by his uh, daughter uh, and uh, La Roldana. So uh, uh, yes, we're looking forward to reopen one day and uh, show the wealth and extent of our collections. Our collections that also include wonderful ceramics, these are not exactly ceramics. Uh, and at our next uh, tertulia, and first let me thank you uh, very much, Elaine, for your wonderful presentation. My uh, pleasure. Tertulia uh, will be on uh, Tuesday, uh, August 4th, the first Tuesday of the month. And we will have uh, Margaret Connors McQuaid, who is assistant director as well as curator of decorative arts, and she will discuss uh, ceramics uh, from uh, Mexico. That should be fascinating as well. And uh, finally, uh, I want to remind you that you can uh, send more comments, more questions to our development office. You can simply email uh, development at hispanicsociety.org. You can even do more than that if you're not yet a member is to join. And if you're already a member is to join at a higher level. Uh, so thank you all for joining uh, us today and we're looking uh, forward to very much to seeing you on the 4th of August. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.